there. All right, time for our message this morning. Um, this morning we have a special uh, message. And it's we're looking at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 6 this morning. It's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. Okay, and it says there, Acts chapter 9, verse 1, says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Let's bring these things to the Lord. Let's commit this time to him now. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your precious word. We thank you for the message that you bring us each week. And I pray, Lord, that I'd be hidden behind your cross as I seek to share that truth which you have given to me. I pray that this day I'd be an encouragement to our fathers and all the men, specifically, but to every believer as well. Lord, about your ways, and that we would grow more to be like you, and that we would do your will in our lives. We thank you once again for this time. We thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now today, we've already mentioned we celebrate Father's Day, uh, and it's an opportunity today to honor our fathers. Um, it's not a biblical thing. We don't find Father's Day or Mother's Day in the Bible, but there's nothing wrong with celebrating Father's for one day in the year um, and uh, today we would seek to honor our fathers and to remember what they do for us and to challenge one another to become better men and fathers as well fathers have a very important part or role to play in the lives of their children their families and also within the church they're often called upon to make important decisions to be a strong support to people around them especially their families to protect and nurture those uh, that they have charge of to lead, the, from the, to lead them from the front, to be examples to them, and to look for solutions uh, when problems arise. There is a great need, though, for godly fathers, men who would follow their saviour, and to be the lights to their families that are desperately needed, because children first learn about God from their parents. And fathers play a very important role um, uh, to their children, because they, they, they're the first examples that the children see of Christ and who Christ is like. So to that end, it, there's, godly fathers are a great necessity uh, in this world. Uh, being a godly father or a godly man to that end requires godly knowledge and wisdom. For such wisdom and knowledge is necessary in order to make, to make godly decisions uh, and choices which affect the lives of others around them in order to exhort men both others and those who are not fathers or maybe those who be becoming fathers to fulfill their godly roles i'd like to look at the life of a man in the new testament who is a wonderful example of being a godly man <clears throat> this passage we just read centers around um, the early church it mentions paul there it mentions paul's uh, activities during that time the early church uh, led by the apostles in the first century, was not a church at peace, uh, but it was a church in hiding uh, because the world had declared war upon it. You see, when the church began in Jerusalem, it started off everything okay by meeting the temple every day, but soon after, uh, they weren't allowed to meet the temple anymore and they began to be persecuted for their beliefs. And Paul was one of the best persecutors. He was the one who felt it necessary to um, rid uh, Jerusalem and Israel of this, what they would have thought was a cult. So he was one of those uh, leaders in this war against the actual church. And he was himself a young man. And his name was Saul of Tarsus. And he, we know that later on he, he came to be known as Paul after he became an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
And, and Saul was a very eager student of Gamaliel. He was regarded as a very wise teacher during those days. And he quickly rose through the ranks of the Pharisaic order in Jerusalem. Paul was the one who witnessed the stoning of Stephen. He was there uh, holding people's clothes while they went to kill him, while they stoned him. He conducted also a number of raids upon Christians in Jerusalem in their own homes. So for those of you who are Christians wondering about you know, how we, we're living in this world and the lockdown we're in, and I know there's some trepidation about that, and there's always a concern about our freedoms. Imagine being in a society where you're being hunted down and the next knock at your door would be them taking you away simply because you believed in Jesus. So Paul, uh, Saul, had quite a mission on his hands and he wanted to rid the world of this heresy. He wanted to purify the Jewish religion from this deviant teaching that had arisen called Christianity. He saw Christianity as a threat to his religion, to the purity of his religion. And he was going to do his best to protect his faith from these fanatical Christians. So it says in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. He wanted now authority to do more of it. And it says, in desire of him, letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they, uh, they were men or women, he might bring them bound, arrested to Jerusalem. Saul was one committed character. At one stage, he sought permission to visit the synagogues, not just in Jerusalem. He wanted to go to Damascus because he'd heard that Christianity was infecting there as well. So Damascus is in Syria, so not even in his own country. He wanted to, to take this thing to other places simply to weed out and to destroy Christianity as thoroughly as he could. So he wanted to expand his witch hunt to Syria and drag back anyone who had been accused of belonging to this sect. But on his way there, he had an encounter. He had a surprising encounter with the leader of this sect who introduced himself as Jesus. Without hesitation, Paul recognized who he was talking to and he bowed the knee and called Jesus Lord. Saul had met the risen Christ on his road to Damascus. And we often speak about that as a... Uh, uh, as, a, as an example of a life-changing experience, your Damascus Road uh, experience. Well, that's where we get it from. Um, Paul's life completely changed when Jesus uh, met him along the way. His life would never be the same again. He went from uh, persecuting the church, wanting to destroy it, to being one of its greatest apostles. After a time, Saul um, returned again to Jerusalem. And he wanted to join himself with the other disciples, the very ones he originally wanted to destroy, to weed out and to arrest. Look at it says, what it says in verse 26, 27 and 28 of Acts chapter 9. It says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him. And brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. And that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. Look at that. What a complete turnaround. Paul was going to Jerusalem to lock up Christians. And now here's Barnabas saying, I saw him preach boldly for Jesus in Damascus, the very place he was going to persecute Christians. But when he came back to Jerusalem and wanted to meet the apostles and say, I want to, I'm one of you guys, I want to be together with you, there was a great fear in the church. Obviously, because of Saul's reputation there. And you would, would you really blame them? I mean, Stephen had been stoned to death. Others had been arrested. Even though Saul had experienced a genuine conversion, the fear was that he was using this as a ploy to infiltrate the church. 
the fear was he was a counterfeit Christian whose only job was to try to get into the church. And once he found out where everyone was, especially the apostles, that he would try and destroy it from the inside. In other words, they didn't believe him. They didn't trust him. And this brings us to the main character of the sermon today. And his name is Barnabas. Now, Barnabas had spent personal time with Saul in Damascus and was in a perfect position to be the bridge maker between the two. You see, there's two parties here. One wants to be part of, it, of, of, this, uh, of this group. And the other one says, mm, I don't trust you. You've done too many bad things for us to, to trust you or let you in. But here's Barnabas who knew Paul on a more personal level. Barnabas had information that the apostles in Jerusalem maybe didn't have. And Barnabas was in a position to bring these two together. Barnabas was well regarded in the church. He had a very good reputation within the church and was careful to explain to the apostles what he had seen in Saul's life, the change that he had experienced and what he now believed about him. Barnabas made an effort to build that bridge between those two so that trust could begin to exist and begin to grow and that fear and anxiety could be laid aside. But in order for that peace to exist, in this case between the church leaders and Saul, effort needed to be made and risk need to be taken. Barnabas took that challenge and we probably exist here today as a church because of his choice and his effort. We're going to look at today at, at the life of Barnabas um, and we're going to discover how critical Barnabas was to the Gentile church. So what does Barnabas's life have to do with us? Well, let me give you a bit of an encapsulation as to what I'm thinking before I even go there. Do you see turmoil around you? Do you see fear around you where misunderstanding and, and anxiety exists? If so, then you're called to help set things straight and to make the effort to build bridges of trust through understanding and truth. Truth is so essential and we must be the ones who speak the truth, not conjecture or speculation, but the truth. The most important truth is that truth that's found in the word of God. It should be the focus of our hearts and our lives. We do this both on a personal level, within our families, our church, our circle of friends. We've been called even to be the bridge builders and the peacemakers between heaven and earth. This is a huge responsibility that we bear. And men, I speak to you today as fathers and as godly men, as those who have been saved by the grace of God, that you have a very important responsibility in the lives of your families, in the life of your church, in the life of your friends and acquaintances outside of the church, and also between heaven and earth itself. We can make a difference. The question is, are we up for the challenge? You see, this world is filled with untruths. It's filled with exaggerations, outright lies, and lies that are often mixed up with the truth that make them seem like truth. Are we up to the task of rightly dividing the word of God? Are we up to the truth of discerning? A, are we up to the task of discerning the truth from the lie and helping people to see the clearer picture? Because that is what we've been called to do. Are the things we share bringing people peace or do they stoke fear? Are we pointing people to the truth of Christ, which brings peace, or are we complicating the message with other things that lead to confusion? I've had this conversation now with a few people, and my challenge to us today is, as we look at the life of Barnabas, is do not mix up the gospel or biblical truth with politics 
or other things that we see in our world today. I know it's very easy to do that, and oftentimes those lines look very blurry. But our job is to present the truth of the gospel. Everything else that we share is in this world. And God is in control. And we need not have fear as Christians as to what tomorrow will bring. Even if we were in the same situation as the disciples in Jerusalem, God is in control. And our call is to be faithful and to worship our Saviour. There is peace with knowing Jesus Christ. Everything else brings anxiety and fear. Are we pointing people to the truth of Christ, which brings peace? Or are we complicating that message? The choice is ours. And either way, we will influence people around us one way or the other. Whether we speak or whether we don't speak. Whether we uh, present a pure message of the gospel or whether we mix it up with other things. God has called us to bring his truth. And his truth always brings peace. Were the fears of the apostles in Jerusalem correct? Were they warranted? Well, from the evidence that they had experienced and witnessed, yes. They were justified in keeping away from Saul. That, that all they knew was that Saul, essentially, was someone who was seeking to destroy the church. The threat of damage to the church was a distinct possibility. But they didn't have all the information, you see. Something had changed in the meantime. They did not know Paul's heart as someone called Barnabas did. They had not, as Barnabas had, witnessed Paul's preaching, experienced his conversion and the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. They had not spent time praying together with Paul and hearing the heartfelt prayer as Barnabas had. The missing piece of information made a world of difference to the church and to the apostle Paul and Barnabas knew that. But in order for Paul or Saul to be able to fulfill his calling by the Lord, he needed to be accepted by the church. Barnabas accepted the responsibility of sowing the seeds of peace, of giving that extra information that clarified the truth, that would allow the Spirit of God to work through Paul in the church for God's glory. So what missing piece, as we begin this sermon, what missing piece of information are we in possession of that might bring peace to people's lives? Our world is often filled with fear, mistrust, misunderstandings, which arise and lead to broken relationships, both within the church and outside of the church. And those things lead to division and strife. This brokenness is something that we are called to address and to be the peacemakers in our world. The gospel is precisely that thing, precisely the same thing. The world has a wrong view about God. They don't trust him. If they believe in him, they, have, they probably have a warped view of him. They don't understand the gospel. They are missing the information, the information that we have. The information that we know to be true. We have learned through his word and through, he, through our experience and through our relationship that we have with God that we can trust him, that he is loving and that he loves the world. And so we are called to be like Barnabas. We are called to be the bridge builders, the peacemakers. But being a peacemaker most likely means that we have to risk our own peace and speak up. How much peace could we plant? How many seeds of peace could we sow if we simply spoke the truth with love and grace? In his life, we will find that Barnabas chose not to stay silent. When he knew something that others did not know, he shared that truth with them. To help clarify the situation. He chose to intervene for a purpose. To bring peace to people's lives. To bring peace to the church. Do you remember Jesus saying 
In Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. If you are a child of God this morning, if you have bowed the knee to Jesus and you've been adopted into God's family, you are a child of God and you are called to be a peacemaker. The gospel is the missing piece of the puzzle which people need to understand and hear in order for them to have peace with God. Our message is God loves you and he sent his son to this earth to rescue you from your own sin. So we've been called to be the peacemakers in our world. The first calling is to help people find peace with God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says there, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's the blessing that we have as being believers, that by simple faith in Jesus Christ, we have found peace with God. Simply being justified by faith, not by works, not by things that I have to do, not by sacrifices that I make, but because of a sacrifice that he made, because of the love that he showed, all I have to do is come to him by simple faith, trusting that Jesus will save me. So the first thing we see in the man of God, the first thing I'd like to challenge our men with is that where there is an opportunity to bring peace, we have an, and we have the knowledge, it's our responsibility to bring that truth to them so that they can have peace too. This is, first of all, between God and mankind. If we can, if we can share that truth that bridges that gap between them, then we've been called to do that. But it's also between people. And people seem to be a lot more messy sometimes as well. But let's see how Barnabas brought peace between Saul, or Paul, and the disciples. Look at verse 26 again, Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 28. It says, when Paul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed, he wanted to join himself to the, to the disciples. He decided to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out of, at Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul had been converted and called to be an apostle by Jesus Christ. But his entrance into the church was more complicated and problematic because of his history. As a persecutor of the church and as a willing witness to Stephen's martyrdom, Paul was a fearful character to the church. One of the hardest things to accept by people sometimes is that people sometimes change. Is that people change their minds sometimes and even change their character. And God can do that. And this was true for the disciples as well. They found it hard to believe that Paul was a genuine believer now. Barnabas knew Saul personally, though, and this was a very important thing. But there was something else that was very important. It was Barnabas' standing in the church in Jerusalem that made the difference. Barnabas had a very good reputation in the church. And he was able to, because of that reputation, do what he was about to do. Let me ask you a question. Would you trust someone who was not a responsible believer to bring someone who could destroy your church into the church? So let's say you knew a believer and they were up and down like a yo-yo. They didn't know their doctrine very well at all. They never showed good fruits in their life. And all of a sudden they came along and said, you know what? I know this guy. I want to bring him into the church. And this other person was someone who you knew was a destroyer of the church. Would you trust that person's judgment to risk bringing him into the very heart of the church? Probably not. 
but they did with Barnabas. And that says a lot about what the apostles believed about Barnabas. You know, reputations are not built up overnight. And the same is true for Barnabas. He was trusted because over time, he had shown himself to be trustworthy, to be wise, to be knowledgeable in the things of God. And he was considered faithful because he had shown himself to be faithful. He was consistent he was considered trustworthy because he showed himself to be trustworthy. He was considered faithful because he had shown himself to be faithful over time. Let's have a look at a specific place where Barnabas is first introduced to us in Scripture. And this is probably very telling about his nature and about the type of person that he was consistently in the church. Go back to Acts chapter 4, verse 34 to 37 with me. Acts chapter 4, verse 34 to 37. Now, this is pretty early on in the church, chapter 4. Uh, the church started at the beginning of, of Acts, but Acts chapter 4 is pretty close to the beginning. Now, look what it says here. Verse 34 says, Neither was there any among them that lacked in the church, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold. And laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according to his need. You know what? The church was the first one to have a collection system, or people who who wanted to give, they'd give it to the money to the um, to the apostles, and then they would minister to those who didn't have food, clothing, or housing. We have in our country today. Uh, a social security system where people who don't have work can get some support from the government, where if you're sick, you get medi uh, Medicare um, and other things of that nature. We have a social system that protects the vulnerable and the weak. Well, there was no social security. There were no pensions in those days. There was no unemployment benefits. There was no Medicare. There was nothing. So what the church decided to do for every believer was to actually give money to support them and feed. You, you'll recognize that if you read through the New Testament about the church, they had a very specific focus on orphans and widows. And they knew they were the most vulnerable uh, group in the church. So they made an effort to help feed them. And this is what was happening. People... As the people were joined to the church, they realized there was a need. There was brother so-and-so who couldn't eat. There was sister so-and-so who had lost her husband who couldn't even work the land and had no food and was in, in danger of starvation. There were others who were sick who needed to be looked after, but there was no one there. So believers willingly, it says here, sold land, sold their possessions, get, got the money and put it at the, at the apostles' feet and said, do with it what you think is right. But look at what it says in verse 36 and 37. It says, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is by interp interpret being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's an interesting phrase. Why do they mention him specifically? Because this fellow would play a very important role in the church. And he's one of the first people that sold land that he had and he gave it all to the church that they could minister to people's needs. So from the very beginning, Barnabas here has a very giving attitude. He has a heart to give. And he sold what he had and he gave the money to the church. And then it says they even nicknamed him. So they gave him a surname or a nickname that was the son of consolation, the son of comfort and support because of his character. What a testimony. Wouldn't you love to be named the son of comfort, the son of support, the son of consolation? And this is the next thing that a godly man and a father needs to possess. A godly man or a godly father has matured to the point that he is trustworthy and consistent 
in living his faith. He looks to the needs of others before himself. And in doing that, he shows himself to be a dependable character, not um, uh, up and down like a yo-yo. Not someone who gets swept around with the cares and concerns of this world, but someone who knows the word of God, who knows how to apply it. And he consistently shows that knowledge and that love of Christ to others. Let me ask you a question this morning, gentlemen. What do you think the people in the church might believe about you this morning? Now, I'm not saying that we need to be perfect or that we are perfect because we all need to be improving every day. But what do you think people believe about you? Comparing yourself to Barnabas this morning and his consistency, trustworthiness, faithfulness and giving, do they see you as dependable? Do you think that you have the consistency of this man? Well, if we don't, then our job is to become more like him. Do you consistently show the love of Christ to people around you in your life, both in your home, in the church and outside of the church? Is the person that they see outside of the church consistent with the one in the church and in your family? Is it the same man? It should be. Would you be trustworthy enough for the church to accept your testimony about someone who was even an enemy of the church, as they did with Barnabas. What's your reputation like? What have you built up over the years? That's my question to you this morning. And I'm saying that I'm even perfect, by far, that we should always be examining ourselves and we should always be seeking to become better men for the Lord. Look at verse 27 of chapter 9 in Acts again. It says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. So Barnabas was in, a, was in a situation where he had Paul who wanted to join. He knew Paul personally. He knew information about him. They wouldn't let Paul in. And it says there that he brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at, the, at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Consider now the discussions that Barnabas would have had to have had before he brought Paul before them. I mean, verse 27 doesn't just mean that, you know, he knew that they were fearful. And then one Sunday morning in the middle of a church service, Barnabas brings Paul in the middle of the church service. No, he would have approached the apostles beforehand. And he would have been willing to stake his reputation and fellowship with the church to have Paul stand before them. I can hear his, his voice now saying, yes, we can trust him. It's worth speaking to him. I believe that Paul is a believer and that he has been genuinely converted. And then they would have said, okay, bring him into us. You see, that would have taken some convincing. And on Barnabas's behalf, it would have taken some risk. But Barnabas didn't shy away from having to do the convincing because he knew that it was really important to the church and to the Lord. This speaks about Barnabas's leadership and his commitment to doing what was right, regardless of how complicated or how difficult it became. This is the characteristic of a godly man, one who is not afraid to do what's right regardless of the consequences. Gentlemen and ladies, are you a leader who is willing to stand for the truth even though it may cost you? This is the difference between a godly man or a godly saint and a simple church goer. There are plenty of people who just go to church. There are plenty of people who do nice things. But there are a few who will stand for the truth, even though it costs. Would you risk your comfort for the truth in order to build peace between people, between others? Building peace between people who are feuding can be a very difficult and messy situation. And most of us think twice before ever stepping into that situation. Often the risk to the person who is trying to bring 
broken relationships together or warring parties together is that that person themselves will often lose both of them as friends. What happens sometimes is that when you try to bring two warring parties together, that they may even both turn on you, even they may be both your friends. But a godly man will risk his comfort and his standing for the peace of the brethren and the truth. Let's see what the scriptures say about Barnabas. Turn to Acts chapter 11, verse 19 with me. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Let's see what the scriptures say about what Barnabas was like. It says there in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travelled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Now have a listen to that. Because of the persecution that Saul and others in the, uh, from the temple and from the Sanhedrin were putting on Christians, believers in Jerusalem, they scattered, they ran, they left. And they were, tra they were traveling as far as uh, Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. And they took with them the gospel message and started sharing it with believers, with people there, Jews first. You know, sometimes persecution is not a bad thing because it causes us to go out of our comfort zone, out of our, our nice, secure environment and to do those things which God maybe wants to do. So here we see Greeks being saved because of the persecution that had existed in Jerusalem and Christians traveling to Antioch and other places. And it says that many believed. Now, look who the church at Jerusalem chose to send to check out these things when they heard them. When the church in Jerusalem heard that Greeks were coming to the Lord, they sent Barnabas. Once again, this shows his standing in the church, his reputation, but also shows that Barnabas type was a type of guy who was willing to go where God would send him. The man of God is always willing to go and to be used where he is needed. Is that true of us today as men and as fathers? Are we doing the very things that God wants us to do? Gentlemen, if we don't do the simple things that God wants us to do, what hope is there that we'll do the bigger things? So let's get the simple things right first. Let's be faithful in all the small things that God will grant us to do the bigger ones, just like Barnabas. Now let's see what he did when he got there. In Acts chapter 11, verse 23, it says, Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then Barnabas, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. What a testimony! Not only did Barnabas exhort, when he went there, he found new believers, believers from another uh, country, other, other, uh, other um, uh, cultures who were coming to the Lord. He encourages them, exhorts them, he comforts them and told them, cleave to Jesus, hold on to Jesus. But because of his ministry, many people were added to the Lord as well. Barnabas is described as a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith. And because of this, he also realized that there was an old friend who'd be perfect 
to help build up the church in Antioch. So he travels to Tarsus to go looking for Paul. Now that's a more difficult situation than we would find having to find someone in a city where we would ring, ring ahead of time and find their address and get a GPS map to go and get us there. He travels to Tarsus and eventually gets a hold of Paul or Saul, brings them back to Antioch, and they build the church for a whole year. They spend the whole year teaching, discipling, uh, mentoring, building, preaching. And look at where we get our name from this morning. Where did it start? Be people being called Christians? It didn't start in Jerusalem. It started in Antioch, where Paul, where Barnabas had been sent, and he and Paul were working to establish God's church. What a legacy. What a legacy. That the place where Barnabas went was the place where people were first, first called Christians and we are still called Christians today. What we see in this passage is Barnabas' understanding also of what needed to be done in the church and he simply did it. He went out of his way to find Paul. He thought to himself, wow, Paul would be perfect here. And he went and sought him and brought him back. Barnabas also didn't care about the glory all for himself. He didn't hog all the glory, but brought others in to do the work as well. His goal was to teach, to get people saved, to exhort, and always, always to point people to Jesus. How do we compare to Barnabas this morning? Barnabas was never shy to do the work of the Lord. He, his focus was always that Jesus would get the attention, not himself. He was focused upon building up others rather than himself. This is the mark of a godly man. And the true characteristic of a godly father who seeks to love his children, to be an example to his children, to build up his children in the faith. What you do with your children is really a, a, a mirror of what you should be doing in the church and to the rest of the world. Gentlemen, are you always available for God's work? Do you understand that God has called you to help build the church, to equip and encourage others? Are you pointing people to Christ, both outside of the church in the church and in your own families. This is a huge responsibility that we have. Do you see that Barnabas also teaches us that the work of God is always a team effort. We do it together. That's why it's important for us to continually communicate together, to be together. Now we have a difficulty at the moment of being together in a physical way. But gentlemen, are you bringing us together in other ways? Do you attend even a Zoom meeting? God bless you if you are. But if you're not, if you're not helping your own family to stay connected with the other church people, what are you doing? Are you building up your, your family together? Do you understand that this is a team effort? We can't do this by ourselves. Me as a pastor cannot do it by myself. Absolutely no way. Are you supporting each other and supporting me in the effort? Because God has called us to this, to work together for the building up of faith. This is the calling of all men and fathers. And Barnabas is a wonderful example of this. Finally, we see Barnabas stand up again for the truth and, seek, and seeking to bring peace even at the expense of his closest friendship. Look at Acts chapter 15 with me for a moment, and we find here a difficult passage, a difficult time in Barnabas' life. So think about for a moment. So Barnabas was one of the first ones to, to, to join the church, give everything he had and, and, and to, give, to give to the poorer people in the church. Sacrifice. Barnabas was the one to be sent to Antioch 
to help build the church over there. He's the one who brings Paul in. And they develop, can you imagine the relationship they had together, these two, two, these two gentlemen, as they worked together to build the church? He is a tireless worker. He loves the Lord and he loves people so much he continually wants to bring them in, to build them up in Christ. Now he has a struggle. Acts chapter 15 verse 36 says, And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again. And visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. What a lovely idea. They had planted so many churches along the way over the years. And Paul says, let's go around and visit them all and see how they're doing with Barnabas. Can you imagine the, the effort and the, the memories that they had and the, the times of fellowship that they'd enjoyed during that time? And Paul says, let's go and do that. Verse 37 says, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, that's Paul and Barnabas, that they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. You know, after years of labor with the gospel together as a team, and at the very point where they could go back and, and, and witness the fellowship and the growth of those churches, something happens to them. Barnabas decides and says, you know what, I want to bring John Mark with me. I think we should bring John Mark with us. And Paul says, no way. This is the guy that abandoned us at our previous mission. He left us at Pamphylia. I don't want him coming along. So Paul didn't trust him to stay the course. Barnabas obviously argued the point and said, no, we need to bring him. We should bring him. And the argument became so strong, but they said, all right, no, forget about it. You go your way, I'm going to go my way. We're going to take two different directions. We'll go separately now. So it says that Barnabas took John Mark with him and went to Cyprus, and Paul took Silas. What happened here? Well, Barnabas wanted to give John Mark another chance to build him up in the faith. I'm assuming that John Mark probably was feeling pretty repentant or bad about what had happened previously. See, they'd been on another missionary trip together and he just couldn't hack it. He left, leaving Barnabas and Paul for the work. Paul was not ready to give him another chance. Barnabas was ready to give him another chance and to build him up in the faith. Once again, we see Barnabas is a son of consolation for someone like John Mark, seeking to build him up in the faith even though he had failed before. Paul was not willing to give him a go. And Barnabas lost his partner in the work as a result at this point. Which once again to me shows Barnabas's leadership. Now I'm not just going to say who was right and who was wrong. Barnabas had a goal of trying to build up John Mark. Peter, or Paul, sorry, was not willing for that to occur. Barnabas was willing to sacrifice even his friendship with Paul for the sake of building up John Mark. What's interesting is that it was Barnabas who brought Paul into the church in Jerusalem in the first place when they didn't trust him. And now he was Barnabas again, trying to bring John Mark into the group and Paul was not willing for that to occur. What was the fruit of Barnabas' decision? You know, some people say, oh, look, you know, we've got now letters of Paul um, and his time with Silas. And we see Silas uh, being built up. Praise God for that. And we don't hear much about Barnabas after this. But let me show you two important fruits that came from Barnabas' decision to build up John Mark. And how do we know that what Barnabas did turned out to be good? 
Well, Paul wrote about it himself. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says that only Luke was left with him. Everyone else had gone, and only Luke was there with him. And he says to Timothy, take Mark and bring him with thee. Come with Mark, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Even Paul changed his mind about Mark. And this was because of Barnabas. What a testimony of Barnabas's work. Do you know the other evidence that shows that Barnabas did a wonderful thing, taking John Mark with him? You're holding it, well, you're probably holding it in your hands right now. John Mark is the author of the Gospel of Mark. I wonder if Barnabas hadn't encouraged John Mark when he had failed, whether we would even have the Gospel of Mark in our Bibles today. Just think about Barnabas' role in the early church. You know, Barnabas is not often mentioned as a great hero of the New Testament. But I look forward to one day having a chat with Barnabas. To asking him how it went at the beginning. How he's, what he was focused on, where the Spirit was leading him. And what it was like in the things that he did. Because much of what we have today even possibly being called Christians, is because of Barnabas's faithful work of going where God wanted him to go. Barnabas was one of, if not one of the first people to sell his land and give it to the apostles to feed the poor. He was the one responsible to bring the apostle Paul into the church, which was a blessing to us. He was the one who was sent to, by Jerusalem to the Gentiles in Antioch. And Antioch became the missionary hub of the Gentile, the gospel going out to all the Gentile world. We also have the, the much of scripture being copied and recorded in Antioch. And Barnabas was a critical person there. He was the one who chose to go and get Paul to start and help him with the work at Antioch. He was one of the original founding pastors there. He was the planner of many churches with Paul. He was the encourager of John Mark, the author of the gospel and the Bible. What a legacy. What an example. What a calling that we have been called to. You know, the, the, the Apostle James, I believe, sums up Barnabas's life in two beautiful verses, which we looked at with the, um, the men's leadership group yesterday. Listen to these words and think about what Barnabas did in his life. James chapter 3, verse 17 says, But the wisdom that is from above, from heaven, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. That means easy to be appealed to. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Are you a peacemaker today? Will you be willing to be more like a Barnabas in your life? Let's examine our hearts today. Let's examine our lives and the things we do and be honest with ourselves. Let's celebrate our fathers today. Fathers, happy Father's Day. Let's, separate, let's celebrate faithfulness today. Let's learn from Barnabas and what God has called us to be in his church and to this world. Be the peacemakers and faith builders of your generation. God bless.